The all-you-can-eat buffet, a petri dish of sneeze guards, germ-covered tongs, and day-old, always warm meats. The perfect playground for pathogens and bodily discharges alike. But if you take a step back from this hypochondriac's nightmare, something else emerges. Something far too alluring for mere salmonella to scare away. The buffet comes to represent the very essence of America. One part variety, one part abundance, and one part endless opportunity. Today on Weird History Food, we're loading up our plates with the history of the buffet. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food channel. And let us know in the comments below what other types of restaurants you would like to hear about. Okay, grab yourself a clean plate, and let's load up. 995 all you can eat. We'll see who wins this friggin' hand out, won't we? Despite being an undeniably American tradition, the all-you-can-eat buffet spent its infancy abroad. Way back in medieval times, feasts often featured long tables with a variety of food and drink to choose from. This provided royal hosts with an opportunity to show off their wealth. They were whipping out their finest commemorative Star Trek plates for these events. While this style of serving food was common all across Europe, it's the Swedes who came to have first formalized the practice and give it a name. In the 16th century, visiting guests to Swedish feasts would first be greeted with the Brandsvinsbord, a sort of appetizer table whose name translates to Table of Spirits, which kind of sounds like a card table covered in jello shots. In actuality, this table would often contain finger foods like cheeses, breads, smoked fish, and cured meats. But the star of the show was always the Brandvin, a spiced vodka that got the appetite going and the guests popping and locking. Uh, probably. After a century of binging out on these Brandsvins boards, the Swedes had another great idea. What if, rather than reserving this table for pre-dinner gorging, they expanded it into an entire meal? And thus, in the early 18th century, the first ever smorgasbords were born. Unlike the American all-you-can-eat experiences to come, smorgasbords were usually reserved for feeding guests who had traveled long distances and would be pretty dang hungry. There weren't interstates back then. You couldn't just pull off the road and inhale a sausage biscuit in a Bob Evans parking lot. The Swedes enjoyed smorgasbords for a couple of centuries in their northern solitude unnoticed and untouched by the rest of the world. Meanwhile, the 18th century French aristocracy loved making their eyes bigger than their stomachs with a refined version of the medieval feast table. They would showcase their expensive plateware on long, bedazzled tables filled with the day's most extravagant delicacies, all of which were meant to be eaten while standing. After all, you don't sit while you jog, and eating this much food is no less of a workout. Similarly, it is thus from the Middle French word for a side table, buffet, that the modern English buffet finds its origins. At the same time, over in America, all-you-can-eat dining options began popping up as early as 1837. However, these options relied on servers bringing individual orders over to the table, one at a time which is terribly inefficient when you're trying to eat as much Golden Corral spaghetti as possible before the song on the radio ends. But in 1912, all of that was set to change. That year, it was Sweden's turn to host the Winter Olympics. As spectators from around the globe came to watch the games, Stockholm's restaurants fed their hungry masses the only way they knew how, with smorgasbords, which became a defining experience for those who attended that year's games. Though smorgasbord hype was whispered around the globe, it wouldn't find its way to America for another 27 years, with that year's World's Fair in New York. And Lady Liberty has raised her torch with a mighty belch ever since. It didn't take long for someone to take the smorgasbord idea and turn it into an American classic. And that bold visionary was Herb McDonald, the publicist for El Rancho Vegas the first ever casino resort to open on what would eventually be known as the Las Vegas Strip. One night in 1946, Herb was hungry, and he got himself some cold cuts and cheeses from the casino's restaurant and laid out a personal smorgasbord. To Herb's surprise, guests began asking if they could join him in his chow down, and Herb was struck then with a billion-dollar realization. By laying out tables of food on the casino floor, guests could grab a bite whenever they got hungry and then get straight back to gambling. 
No more leaving for sit-down restaurants or heading back to their rooms to snack. Guests could stay right inside the casino, where they could keep putting money into the casino's pockets. Soon after, El Rancho took Herb's idea and opened up the Buckaroo Buffet, a 24-hour, all-you-can-eat dinner that reportedly had every possible variety of hot and cold entrees to appease the howling coyote in your innards. Ironically, Vegas buffets have inflicted more than a few stomach wolves themselves in the years since. The entire Buckaroo Buffet experience only cost a buck. While the buffet itself technically lost money, it kept people right where El Rancho wanted them, on the casino floor never more than five feet away from a slot machine or a blackjack dealer. As more casino resorts opened up on the Strip, it didn't take them long to start adopting Herb's idea as well. Soon, virtually every casino had its buffet, and the trend outgrew Las Vegas quicker than a pair of skinny jeans to become a national phenomenon. As buffets proliferated around Vegas, it was only a matter of time before the all-you-can-eat model spilled out into the rest of America. You can only put so much on those little plates. Even so, the first buffets to pop up elsewhere in the country didn't serve the all-American dine-in experience found in Las Vegas. Instead, they focused on Chinese food. Way back in the 1800s, over a quarter of a million Chinese immigrants came to America, seeking jobs in mines, on farms, and on the railroads. However, as more and more immigrants arrived, some began to feel threatened by a vast influx of workers willing to work for lower wages, and anti-Chinese sentiment grew to a boiling point. With the 1882 passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, severe restrictions were put in place concerning the number of Chinese immigrants allowed into the country in any given year. At first, absolutely no Chinese immigrants were allowed into the U.S. But as time wore on, lawmakers began to make exceptions to the rule, depending on which industry a person was looking to seek employment in. And in 1915, restaurant work was added to that list of exceptions. It didn't take long for Chinese restaurants to start turning up all across America. In fact, the number of American Chinese restaurants quadrupled between 1910 and 1930. And many immigrants used this so-called Lomain loophole to bring their extended families across the Pacific. The Chinese Exclusion Act wasn't fully repealed until 1943. By that time, Chinese restaurants were just about everywhere. And after the advent of the buffet in 1946, they began to incorporate America's newest and boldest restaurant style into their businesses, like Chang's Restaurant. Chang's was a Los Angeles Sunset Strip establishment, started by restaurateur Peter Chang. As early as 1949, Chang's had adopted the buffet model, serving over 20 different entrees for the low price of $2.85 in what was then referred to as a Chinese smorgasbord. Over the years that followed, Chinese smorgasbords began popping up all across the country. And by 1960, they were just about everywhere. Because who doesn't like a big old mountain of fried dumplings? Greeting and serving guests. Good evening. Fine enough to eat today? Boy, I'll say. Well, that's great. Would you care for some hammer beef? A little both, I think. All right. As Chinese buffets became commonplace, the groundwork was being laid for some of today's most prominent national buffet chains. For instance, the first Shoney's opened up in 1947, just one year after the creation of the Buckaroo Buffet. But this initial Shoney's didn't have any sort of buffet at all, which should be against the law. And that smug little bear has nothing else for us. Instead, it was a West Virginia drive-in restaurant that had recently been renamed under the Big Boy brand. It lived out the next three years under the Big Boy name until it reverted back to Shoney's around 1955, the year Marty McFly kissed his mom. After expanding to over 30 locations over the next few decades, Shoney's then shed their big boy affiliation altogether, and Shoney's increased their number of sit-down locations and eventually introduced buffets to the restaurants. Sizzler followed in a similar trajectory. Their first ever location opened in Culver City, California in 1958, and it was advertised specifically as a steakhouse, a family steakhouse. It wasn't until the late 1970s that Sizzler introduced their first ever salad bars, which would eventually grow into full-on, all-you-can-eat experiences. Golden Corral, one of the BMOCs of all-you-can-eat hedonism, first opened its doors in 1973. It too began life as a steakhouse, eventually adding salad bars to the mix before transforming into a binge until you drop gorge hut. Sizzler's new all-you-can-eat buffet court. Where do we start? 
individual islands of specially prepared foods. Let's start at the salad bar. Which end? Pasta. Tostadas. Good, Good idea. idea. By the 1980s, all three of these chains were expanding their all-you-can-eat options. And the nation entered what is now known as the golden age of the American buffet, truly a thing of beauty. 1983 likewise saw the creation of the now-defunct Buffets, Inc., who would eventually rebrand under the Vita Nova brand's umbrella. Unlike the non-buffet origins of its competitors, Buffets, Inc. knew just what kind of restaurants they were making from the very start. They would eventually be responsible for Old Country Buffet, Hometown Buffet, Ryan's Buffet, and Furs, some of which began as privately owned traditional restaurants that Buffets Inc. scooped up like a lump of salad bar potatoes and converted into buffet-style establishments. All the while, fast food brands tried to get in on the massively popular trend. It's kind of what they do. McDonald's, Wendy's, KFC, and Pizza Hut all attempted variations on the all-you-can-eat buffet. The long-gone McDonald's buffet was reserved for breakfast, while the late Wendy's Buffet, or Super Bar, as they like to call it, included both Italian and Mexican options. While those two buffet experiences are so long gone they're barely more than legend, both Pizza Hut and KFC buffets still exist in some locations to this day, and you must not rest until you find them. Today, Las Vegas, Nevada, the patient zero of the American buffet, is home to over 40 different all-you-can-eat options. While all of them cost a far cry more than Herb McDonald's original $1 slam fest, they range in price from the cheap and basic to the pricey and extravagant. Some of the more expensive options, such as those found at Bally's and Wynn, cost customers $70 or more per seat, and you don't even get to keep the chair. But these higher-end buffets come with hundreds of higher-end items, like lobster tail, oyster sushi, and bottomless champagne. And with inflation running more wild than Hulkamania, many seem to view these pricier buffets as the only way to afford high-ticket items while visiting Las Vegas. Likewise, Vegas buffets today are reportedly experiencing waits upwards of two hours during peak times. That's enough time to watch the Master of Disguise twice while waiting for your table. And nobody needs that vacation memory. But this increased interest in buffet dining does not end in Sin City. Though several buffet chains, including Old Country Buffet and Sizzler, had to file for bankruptcy during the lockdown period of the COVID-19 pandemic, buffets the nation over have made a big comeback since things started opening back up in 2021. Reportedly, buffet traffic is up 125% over the last two years, outpacing both fast casual chains and full-service restaurants alike, and exceeding pre-pandemic levels by catering primarily to low- and middle-income customers looking for a deal, which, statistically speaking, is most people. Still, for those wanting the ultimate buffet experience, look no further than Lancaster County's Shady Maple Smorgasbord. Shady Maple boasts a 200-foot buffet of the finest foods the Pennsylvania Dutch have to offer, along with enough floor space to serve 7,000 people on any given day. Golden Corral could never, unless you pushed a bunch of them together. That totals to about a million and a half stuffed to the brim customers every single year, making it not only America's largest buffet, but a leading contributor to postprandial somnolence, otherwise known as a food coma. So what do you think? What's your go-to buffet plate item? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other weird history food videos.